1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Well, tonight, with the Lord's blessing, we'll take up a new Puritan study. It's called Richard Baxter on Self-Examination. Baxter was an English pastor born in 1619, died in 1691. Like everyone else, he had his weaknesses. But when it comes to practical living for Christ, nobody's a better counselor than he. Before we get into the hows and whys of self-examination, let's define the term and set its goal. To examine yourself means to carefully and honestly look at your life for signs of spiritual health or sickness. Its goals are peace of mind and holiness. You ought to examine yourself. The Bible says so. It says so here and other places too. Psalm 139 is a good cross-reference. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way everlasting. Like other good things, self-examination may be overdone. I've known Christians who are fixated on themselves, their sins, their weaknesses, their feelings, and so forth. Are you that way? Well, you are if you think more about yourself than you do about Jesus Christ and other people. When I was a boy, I learned an acronym that has been very helpful to me since. I haven't practiced it all that well, but I have remembered it carefully. When it comes to thinking, remember the letters J-O-Y, joy. Jesus, others, yourself. Think of Jesus Christ First, others second, yourself third, you'll be all right. And so do you remember what self-examination is? It's taking an honest look at your life, looking for signs of spiritual health or sickness. Can you name its goals? The goals are peace of mind and holiness of life. Should you do it? Yes, because the Bible commands you to, and holy men have always done that. And can you overdo it? Sure you can. But you shouldn't and uh, need to be careful in that way. And so do you want to examine yourself? If you do, Richard Baxter can be a lot of help. He has much to say on the subject and we'll get to some of it tonight. Number one, if you want to examine yourself, stay at it. If you want to examine yourself, stay at it. The person who goes to a physical exam once every 10 or 20 years has no idea what his health is like. It requires a lot more, uh, many more examinations than once every 10 or 20 years. The same thing is true about the examining of your souls. This is something you've got to stay at. It's something you've got to do regularly. The Puritan says, Let watchfulness over your heart and life be your continual work. Never grow careless or neglectful of yourself. As an unfaithful servant may deceive you if you look after him only now and then, so may a deceitful heart. Let it be continually under your eye. Now the illustration is very helpful. Some employees are quite responsible. Tell them what to do in the morning and they'll do it without supervision. But others are not this way. Some employees have to be watched every second of the day. If you turn your back on them, they'll be goofing off. They'll be stealing. They'll be doing something else. And so let's face it, some workers require constant supervision. Now, I wish your heart or mine... uh, was like the good worker but in fact it isn't Jeremiah 17 9 describes the human heart calling it deceitful above all things and desperately wicked that means you've got to keep a close eye on your heart you've got to do it every day now and then won't 
do. Self-examination is a daily discipline. No matter how busy you are during the day or how tired you are at night, you've got to honestly evaluate yourself. What did I do right today? What did I do wrong today? I thank God that He helped me do A, B, and C. And yet I've got to confess X, Y, and Z shouldn't have been done. Proverbs 4, 3 says, Keep the heart with all diligence. It's been said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That's right, of course. And holiness comes no cheaper. When you know you've committed a sin, confess it to the Lord instantly. Whether you feel guilty or not, remember, guilt is not determined by your feelings. Confess your sin then and there to the Lord. Again, you don't have to speak out loud. You see, one of the wonderful things about being a Christian is you don't have to go to a priest to confess your sins. You can simply confess your sins right to the Lord. And because the Lord knows everything, you can confess them without even opening your mouth. You don't have to speak aloud. You might be in a conversation. You've said a gossipy word. And yet you don't want to compound it by bringing it back up to your friends. That's all right. Simply confess it to the Lord in your soul. He hears it and forgives it when it's honestly confessed. Now this all by itself will catch many sins. Bedtime, go over the day in your mind and confess the ones you missed. Conscience is like a credit card. The longer you wait to pay it off, the worse it gets. That's number one. If you want to practice good, solid, uh, edifying self-examination, stay at it. Once a year won't do. Once a week won't do. You've got to evaluate yourself daily. I was in Nevada a year or two ago and I went to an Anglican church and you know the sermon was really very, very good. And I was highly encouraged by what I heard. But on my way out I saw a tract rack, kind of like the one we've got in the back over here, and it had something on confession. So I decided to pick out a little tract and take it home and take a look at it. Now, I just figured it meant the confession that I was describing, confessing your sins to the Lord, He's faithful and just to forgive you, and so forth. But, well, that's not what this tract meant. This tract meant what they call auricular confession, confessing your sins to a priest. And the advice that it gave left me just thunderstruck. It said, if you're an ordinary Christian, it's good to confess your sins at Easter and Christmas. But if you're really, really sensitive about your sins, it's better to confess them just once a year, maybe at Christmas. Once or twice a year? I mean, I must have been in a church full of angels. People who just never sinned at all. If confessing once or twice a year was enough for them. I've got to confess my sins every day, many times every day. I tell you, that kind of advice is not keeping the heart with all diligence. You are just not paying attention if you can't think of anything to confess more than once or twice a year. And so that's number one. You've got to stay at it. You've got to practice self-examination every day. Number two. If you want to examine yourself, go to church. If you want to examine yourself, go to church. Here's the quote. Live in the light as much as possible. I mean under a faithful pastor and among wise and mature Christians, for they will be telling you what you should be and do along with detecting your errors. In the light, you are not likely to be deceived. You know, I always look really, really good in front of a mirror as long as the light is turned off. (laughs) I mean, I look so handsome, muscular, thin, just really young, all of that. But you know, when I turn the light off, I turn the light on, I see that, well, I'm not too muscular, I'm not too young, I'm not too thin, I'm sure not very good looking. Well, many people prefer looking at themselves in the dark. But here I don't mean their bodies. Here I mean their souls. They live with other ungodly people. They live with cold-hearted, backslidden Christians. And by comparison, they look pretty good. 
in the darkness, every woman is beautiful, every man is handsome, and every soul looks clean. And so sometimes we've got to turn the light on and take a look at things as they really are. And one place where the light shines is that church. Now you see, when a church is healthy, the Word of God is taught from the pulpit. And that Word, Paul says, is profitable or useful. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Listening to good sermons, or even fair sermons, mediocre sermons. Listening to sermons is good for your soul. But of course, church isn't a one-man show. Others can help you at church also, maybe a lot more than the pastor or preacher. The book of Hebrews commands every believer to watch over his brethren and to exhort them. Exhort means positively to encourage or negatively to correct. Now, you're not saved by the church. We sure don't teach that. You can be saved outside of church. You can go to heaven without ever going to church. That's not the point. But, you know, having said that, the church is a means of grace. It is one way, not the only way, but it is one way the Lord communicates wisdom, mercy to us. The church is not indispensable, but it is important. The believer who doesn't go to church or doesn't participate in his life hurts himself a lot more than he hurts the church. And so if you want to examine yourself better, more honestly than you do now, Involve yourself in the life of the church. Listen to the sermons carefully. And don't be so defensive when people talk to you that they're afraid to say anything. Let your brothers and sisters in Christ keep an eye on you and speak a word of gentle reproof now and then. Church life is good for you. It's good for the soul. And that's number two. Here's number three. If you want to examine yourself... Listen to people who criticize you. Boy, I hate this one. This is one I just can't stand. But you know, the fact that I don't like it doesn't make it any less true. If you want to examine yourself better, know your heart better than you do now, listen to people who criticize you. We all have blind spots. You know why they call them blind spots? Because we really can't see. We really can't see. I mean, honestly, it's not just a matter of self-delusion. I don't want to think about it, so I pretend it's not there. Uh, That's true, too, in its own way. That's a certain dishonesty we all suffer from. But we also have legitimate, honest blind spots. Now, Paul the Apostle, before he was saved, had this blind spot. He read the Bible. He read the Old Testament as carefully before he was saved as he did afterward. But you know what he said about it? He said, as touching the law, I was blameless. That's how he really felt. He really felt, felt that he did God's, he kept God's law from the heart consistently. That's what he really believed. Now that was a blind spot. Remember, he was a Pharisee. And he'd watered down the law of God terribly to mere external things. And so, of course, he said, I'm really, really good at it. He could keep these things externally. And so we all have blind spots. And because they're blind spots, because I've got my blind spots, I can't see them, but you can. Blind, my blind spots, you can see, and your blind spots, I can see. But me seeing your blind spots, or you seeing my blind spots, doesn't do either one of us a bit of good, unless we've got the courage to tell each other, and the humility to listen to each other. So if you want to become holier, you'll have to listen even if the person who tells you isn't very nice about it. This really makes things worse. It really does. Even when the person who tells you is not very nice about it. Galatians 6.1 tells us how to correct other people. It says, If a brother is overtaken in a fault, you are spiritual. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, we ought to correct others only in a spirit spirit of humility, not condescending, looking down on them, saying, oh, I would never do such a thing. I'm, I'm impervious to that. 
not like that at all. We're to always remember that we have done the very same thing and maybe things a whole lot worse. And that gives some humility to us and meekness when we talk to others. Not just yelling at each other, not just railing at each other. And so that's how we ought to correct, but let's face it, sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we're just socially awkward, very, very blunt. You know, we don't mean to be rude, but we are. And then sometimes it's worse than being socially awkward. Sometimes we're downright mad, aggravated, and so we lash out at people rather than speaking to them in love. But even when someone rebukes you and doesn't do it very nicely, you ought to at least listen. Here's what Baxter says. Discourage not those who would admonish or reprove you. Admonish means warn. Do not discourage those who would warn or reprove you, nor neglect their opinion of you. No, not the railings of an enemy, for he may tell you in anger what you need to hear and give you some light in judging yourself. Criticism is like a big vitamin tablet. It's really good for you, but it's awfully hard to swallow. To help you take criticism better, let me remind you of a few things you're prone to forget. And here I want you to understand that I need to listen to this advice too. First of all, most people don't like to criticize you to your face. If someone does it, assume he's doing it in love and not out of spite and hatefulness. Yeah, spite and hatefulness very often cause gossip. Hey, let me tell you about what he's doing. Let me tell you what she's up to. But very rarely, at least not very often, it's pretty rare that spite and hatefulness cause me to come to you and really tell you your fault just between the two of us. That's one thing. So just assume it's love and not spite. Number two, if someone criticizes you in anger or disgust, Remember, the truth of what he says is not nullified by the way he says it. Charles Spurgeon, the greatest of English preachers, said that um, preachers, he said he once saw a preacher who invited men to Christ like this. Doesn't look very inviting, huh? So he's ready to beat you up, huh? But you know, if I say, come to Christ, He'll receive you, He loves you, this man welcomes sinners... You know, my inconsistent body language does not in any way nullify the fact that Jesus Christ does receive sinners. You know, really, that's true. And the same thing is true about people who criticize you when they're angry or disgusted or aggravated or just cranky or something. Again, what they say may be really, really ugly, but if it's true, it's good for you to hear it. Very hard to do, let me tell you that. Very, very hard to do, but it's still true. Number three. When criticized, think it over before picking it apart. If someone says 20 words of criticism to me and five of those words are wrong, it'd be very easy for me to latch on to those five wrong words and say, ah, this disproves everything he said. But you know, it's not true. The 15 words are still true. And so even though he's, you know, maybe exaggerated or something like that and maybe he's made a wrong assumption here or there still the true criticism is true and it's worth hearing number four when criticized think it over before you tell anyone else about it this is what we all love to do I just love to go home and tell my wife you know what he said about me you know what she said to me you know why I'm doing that don't you it's getting her support oh you're not that way at all honey no 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 you're not that way at all oh you did not do that you're not like that at all we all do that we go to our support groups to get support. But before we go to our support groups, let's just think about what's said. Not wrong to go to somebody, but think about it before you go there. Number five, listening to criticism is not the same as accepting it. I can hear you out even though I disagree with every word you say. So that's, so you know, it's not like you're admitting guilt. If somebody comes to you and says, now I saw you light a fire on that, to that building, you killed 20 innocent people. I mean, hearing the person out doesn't mean you're agreeing that you did light fire to that building. Remember that. So it doesn't hurt anything to listen to criticism. If it's untrue, it shouldn't hurt at all. Uh, number six, 
Remember, God may speak through stupid or bad men. You wouldn't want to miss God's message because the messenger wasn't worthy to deliver it. And here I can give you a really, really good example, a couple of them from the Bible. If you go over to Numbers chapters 22 and 23, you find a guy named Balaam prophesying, speaking the word of God. And I tell you, that man spoke the word of God as truly as Moses or Elijah did. And Balaam was a false prophet. He did it for money. He loved money more than God, and yet he spoke the truth. And so he was a really bad guy who still spoke the truth. But you know, a little bit earlier in that story, somebody else spoke the truth. And that was Balaam's donkey. Balaam's donkey rebuked the prophet. Here's Balaam, a prophet. Here's his donkey. Well, he's a donkey. The donkey knew more than Balaam did. So stupid and even bad people can speak the truth to you. God might well be speaking through them. And then lastly, pray for grace. Criticism is never, ever, 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 ever fun to take. Somebody says, I love to be criticized, has never been criticized. Criticism is never fun. Criticism may be devastating. But still, it's good for us. There's an example in the New Testament of a very sharp and humiliating criticism which saved a man's ministry. There were two pastors, two preachers. And there were more than that, but there were two preachers in a church in Antioch. Antioch, not in California, of course. And... Um, both of these preachers were Jewish Christians and both of them knew that under the new covenant Jews and Gentiles were equal in the sight of God and equally welcome at the church. They belonged together. It wasn't Jews here, Gentiles there. It was mixed together. God blotted out the distinctions that were there in the Old Testament. Both these men knew it but one of the preachers got around some of his Jewish friends and they kind of talked him into the other way. They said, look here, what are we doing with these dirty goyim, goyim, the, the nations? What are we doing with these dirty Gentiles? We're not eating with these people. Let's have kind of a, a group here. we have kind of a Jewish group club in the church. And this preacher decided, well, you know, okay, I'll go along with them. So he went over with his sect, his group, his clique in the church. And this was really, really hurting the church as a whole until the other preacher got wind of it, and right in front of everybody, and they say this was a big, big church, not in the Bible, but that's what tradition says. This was a big, big church, and this other preacher got up in front of the whole church and said, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles do, why do you tell the Gentiles to live as Jews? See, the two preachers were Peter and Paul, two of the greatest apostles and men who ever lived. Paul openly publicly rebuked Peter for his folly and his sin. And that kept the church in the first century from dividing and kept Peter from ruining his ministry and becoming something less than a Christian. And so that's number three. You want to examine yourself better? Listen to criticism. Here's a psalm that's easy to quote but awfully hard to practice. Psalm 141 says... Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. Let the righteous punch me. It'll do me good. Let him bear me out. It's going to be like anointing me with fragrant oil. That's what the psalmist said. Again, that's not always the way we feel, but it is always true. Number three. Let me have, I have uh, one more, I think, is that right? Yes, one more. If you want to examine yourself, ask a close and godly friend to help you. Let me underscore the words close and godly. If you want to examine yourself, ask a close and godly friend to help you. The art of friendship has been pretty much lost. We have colleagues we have buddies, but we have very few friends. The loss is much greater than we think it is. 
For friends can talk to you with a knowledge and an honesty others can't. If you have a close friend, friend, providing he's brave and mature, put him to work for your soul. Ask him about your faults and listen to him when he does. When he tells you. Baxter says, if you have so happy an opportunity, engage some close friend to watch over you and tell you plainly of all that is amiss in you. But deal not so hypocritically as to do this and then be angry when he performs his trust and discourage him by your pride and impatience. Right. Exactly right. Got a close friend who's mature, who's godly. He's a very close friend. Because he's a close friend, he knows you. And because he's mature, he'll have the guts to tell you the truth. But when he does tell you the truth, don't be a hypocrite saying, oh, tell me my false And He says, well, you know, I've been meaning to mention this to you. And then you say, I'm not that way at all. Be all defensive and so on. Uh, a friend could be your wife or husband. He could be somebody who lives on the other side of the world. It doesn't matter really who the friend is but only that he knows you very well and loves you well enough to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, don't let your friend become your conscience. That's important to say, too. Don't let your friend become your conscience. Only Jesus Christ is Lord of the conscience. But if you have this kind of friend, thank God for him, and put him to good use. If you don't have this kind of friend, maybe you should pray for one. Remember, friends are a gift of God. And so pray for a friend. And if it's hard for you to make friends, just remember the proverb that says, to have friends, a man must show himself friendly. Well, that's it for tonight. It's your duty to examine yourself. Our verse says so. Examine yourself. Prove yourself. But it's not only your duty, it's also your privilege. It's a privilege to examine yourself. Now get to it. In the power and wisdom that God gives you. And in the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray, please. Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word tonight and it's a disturbing word. Lord, we don't always like to examine ourselves because we don't always like what we find in our souls. Lord, it's very easy to compare ourselves to other people selectively um, chosen. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't do that, but would compare ourselves to what we ought to be rather than what we are compared to somebody else. Father, I pray that you'd give us the honesty and the courage to look into our souls and also the faith to believe that where we find sins, these sins are forgiven by Christ and our guilt is washed away. Give us the grace to confess our sins and also to forsake them and to follow after holiness, to strive for it, to not be satisfied being lukewarm or respectable or acceptable to the church. And I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't worry only about our outward actions, but also our inward attitudes, thoughts, and feelings. Lord, I pray that the words of our mouths, meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For Christ's sake we pray. 